Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, whatever you're listening to us. You're listening to the Drunken UX Podcast, and I am one of your hosts. I, of course, am the ever-exuberant Michael Feenan. And I'm the less exuberant Aaron Hill. Thanks for joining us tonight. We got to come up with a better tagline for you, man. Less exuberant sounds (laughs) just not as exciting. (laughs) Well, give me a few drinks, I'll become more exuberant. (laughs) I want to thank our sponsors who make the Drunken UX Podcast podcast possible at over at new cloud you can check them out at newcloud.com slash drunken ux that is uh in you cloud.com uh otherwise let me see what else uh, i'm michael Feeney. he's aaron hill we got new cloud as a sponsor oh run by facebook twitter um you can check us out at slash drunken ux at either of those places and keep up with us uh, we retweet stuff we share stuff we let you know about things going on um, schedule changes, things of that nature. So be sure to stop by if you want to check us out on Slack and, and talk to us, especially after today's episode. Uh, we would love to hear what you're doing for security purposes and things like that. So if you run by, either you know hit us on Slack at drunkenux.com slash Slack or um, leave a comment in our show notes or tweet at us, Facebook at us, whatever. I don't care. I just want to hear from you because that is super, super duper exciting for me. So Michael, I heard a lot of liquid getting poured earlier. What are you drinking tonight? Uh, Michael is, um, okay, so I've got a, a slightly pulled oblique muscle from hauling boxes at a conference, and so I'm a little sore, and so I'm self-medicating this evening with um, a glass of scotch, and when I say glass, I don't mean, like, you know, a finger or two fingers of scotch, I mean a glass of scotch. Um, yeah. This is a Spayburn tin. It's a Highland scotch. I don't know much about it. Somebody gifted this to me at some point, and I don't remember who. <laughs> it may have been my brother-in-law. Um, I don't entirely remember. Um, it's It's got very interesting reviews. There are a lot of folks who say it's a really good value. Um, on the nose, it smells a little bit like sweaty socks, so I'm not entirely <laughs> convinced that it's good yet, but I'm going to give it a fair shake, and uh, by the end of this show, you'll probably know how good it is by how good I feel. <laughs> I haven't even seen your glass yet. What are you drinking over there? I have another... TNT Tangerine Tonic with a giant ice cube that I got these um I say a garage sale or something and I got one of those uh, silicon cube trays that yeah. the cube are like two or three inches across and no, it takes like a day and a half to freeze <laughs> no kidding though because I got uh, I do the Reddit um, gift exchange every year mm-hmm. um, for Christmas and the guy who had me as his secret Santa. Uh, that's what he gave me was one nice. of those. It's like the the red silicone yeah. big. They're amazing, aren't they? Oh, I love it. In fact, that's what I'm using here. I've also got some of the spheres too. The yeah, I have uh, those too. The big spheres. So yeah, I never yeah. need for and with with this scotch, I've got a feeling the ice is going to come in handy. So um, <laughs> that's, what I, I found, think. I just have a giant plastic box in my freezer. And I just make the cubes. I guess like you would do with normal cubes, but you have to be like because it takes so long to freeze. You have to do it more often. Yeah, you just don't <laughs> drink enough. That's all that means. Like you can say. <laughs> uh, so today is a special episode. Of course, uh, we have found that bringing people onto the show is a fun, exciting experience, and so we thought, hey, we want to talk a little bit about the basics of web security. Who do we know that knows anything about web security? And uh, my great friend and Aaron's kind of friend. Chris Wigman is on uh, mic number three this evening. Chris, thank you very much for joining us this evening. And I see yeah. that you also have a bottle on your table. I do. Thanks for having me. And uh, yeah, nothing nothing as fancy as scotch or anything that requires an ice cube. But I got a nice uh, Weisstefaner Hef- Hefeweizen. So nice classic beer. Seemed appropriate. Isn't there something special about that particular brewery? Supposedly, they, they they build themselves as the oldest brewery in the world since 1040. So That's impressive. Coming up on a, it, it, I don't know how accurate that is, but they're coming <laughs> up on their proclaimed thousandth anniversary in our lifetimes. I, I feel like there are some uh, some monks in uh, one of those abbeys that would have something to say about that. Doesn't <laughs> isn't there one of those that they like they make a, a bottling of beer like every year, and there's only a few hundred bottles or something, and people line up for miles to buy it. 
I've ever looking at this guy, these guys once, and some they have a story similar to that. And then, yeah, some of the other, especially the Trappist monasteries of that, but the mm, Trappists, Trappists are newer in general. I mean, the That's Trappists, the word. Yeah, Trappists are successors, like, what, 15th, 16th, 16th century. Wow. So I, I don't know how that all comes in there, but... Yeah, these guys say they're the oldest. Maybe that's the oldest commercial one, oldest distributing one. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> so for our listeners, uh, it, you might know Chris from a number of places. He's currently a senior web developer over at uh, the University of Florida. Go uh, Gators. Kind of close, right? How how far is that from Miami? From Miami, five hours. Okay, okay. Yeah, so it's a little little ways. Because I almost uh, was a hurricane when I went to college. I. I had to basically flip a coin between two schools and I chose the wrong one as it turns out. So, uh, but he's also uh, where you really might know him from. If you are a WordPress user of any kind, um, Chris, uh, I, I, I was about to say help develop, but you, I mean, you developed the better WP uh, security plugin, didn't you? Yep. I built that and then uh, eventually sold it to iThemes where it became iThemes security. And, and you worked over there with them for uh, a year or two, uh, a couple years back, right? Yep, I was with them once I sold it and kind of directed the integration, if you will, of that for about a year and a hmm. couple of months before I went to something else. Cool. <laughs> it's so, always really cool seeing that plugin come up like on different themes, like in other people's things. Yeah, it got definitely a lot bigger than I ever had imagined it would once I started it. That's for darn sure. <laughs> I know somebody famous. <laughs> <laughs> so that's... That's Chris. We're going to be talking with him uh, here in just a moment about web security. We're going to kind of run through very basics. We're not going to get deep into firewall configurations and, you know, hardcore SQL injections and penetration testing. We just want to talk about how if you are a web developer, especially a young one getting started or something along those lines, you know, what you should be thinking about and how you just get the very basics going so that you can make sure your stuff is secure. I want to talk first, though. Because I got something I got to share, and it's one of the so. And I I say that, and you know what it makes me think about is like uh, the old horror movies where it's like what the ring. You see mm -hmm. the videotape, and you got to hand the videotape off in seven days, or you die. Yeah. Yes, that's how I feel at the moment. Yeah, well, this you shared it with me, and I got to agree. I think this is the right thing to do. The uh, the headline I came across earlier today, and this has nothing to do with web. I just want to talk about it because I feel creepy. Um, the headline was David Lynch made a disturbing web sitcom called Rabbits. It's now used by psychologists to induce a sense of existential crisis in research subjects. <laughs> and so I, I was like, <laughs> I, I like David Lynch. I have nothing against the man. I enjoy a good, weird, creepy kind of film. And I sat down and watched about 10 minutes of this Rabbits um, episode slash movie. It's kind of unknown what it really is. And all I can say is I don't think I've seen something that weird in about 10 years. Um, Coming from you, that says an awful lot. <laughs> you know, it this feels bizarre. Watching it feels like um, if you ever like sit in a room and just make eye contact with somebody and say nothing. And then there's this whole like parade of feelings that go through. Like at first it's like, oh, like giggle. Like this is fun, weird, like. And then it gets awkward, and then it gets strange, and then it gets this weird place where it just, it just feels it feels too real, and that's kind of so, what it felt like watching this. It, it feels like Lynch took Donnie Darko and put it in a blender <laughs> yes. with too many cooks. That's what it feels like. Yes. Oh my god, too many cooks. Yes. Yeah, definitely. The the style it was made about fifteen years ago, and I think two thousand two is when he recorded this. And he did it when he was doing that recording on like these are either digital aid or something like that. So it's got a very amateur kind of feel to it, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he's he's got that kind of style to his to his uh, filming. Um, all it's got three characters in it. They are anthropomorphized rabbits. Um, yeah, people and giant like rabbits. Looks like a Barbie playhouse almost that they're in. One of those rabbits is Naomi Watts. What? Really? Yeah. Well, she's in like a lot of his film stuff. It's I so the the research they were doing, um, because I had to know, I just I had to understand what was going on. These researchers uh back around 2013 were taking people and they would have they had two groups, and some of them they said here 
write us a few paragraphs on what you think happens to your body when you die. <laughs> and then the other group, they had watch rabbits and write about it or something like that. And they gave them Tylenol. They were, they were testing whether or not Tylenol slash acetaminophen had the ability to relieve the pain of existential crisis. <laughs> And they found that it did. So I need people to feel the weird, uncomfortable, whatever this is that I have mm. in me now, um, which sounds way dirtier than I intended to. Go <laughs> go look up YouTube. It's on YouTube like everything is. David Lynch, Rabbits. Put in the show notes. And cool. yeah, oh, no, there's going to be a link in the show notes. Yes. I will embed the YouTube video there if I have to. Uh, Can, let's also include Too Many Cooks and the um, the Rejected by Don Hertzfeld. Ah, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, those are in a similar vein. My, my spoon is too big. <laughs> I'm feeling fat and sassy. <laughs> so with that, God, now I I don't know if I can get through the rest of the show after that. <laughs> Keep um, drinking. This is by far the best intro I've ever had. There's opening topic to start with security. Then you don't even have to pay us for it. <laughs> <laughs> it we we brought free. you on to save us. What are you talking about? <laughs> Pull us out of this uh, this downward spiral. <laughs> yeah. Nine Inch Nails, David Lynch. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> oh man, that was uh, that was a reach. I'm sorry. Um, so to get started today, we mentioned we're going to talk about web security, some basics. Um, I am going to try effort to split us up into, you know, two halves. First, I want to talk a little bit about basic, like the server level stuff uh, and just the, you know, the simple tools that are out there and what you can use. And then we'll get a little bit more into like the actual web side of things on application level and stuff like that. Help you understand the different types of attacks that are out there and how you protect against those. Um, and Chris, if you think we're going to get off of here without talking about WordPress a little bit, well, you're wrong. Uh, <laughs> that's going to happen. But uh, Chris is a great guy to help us along and keep us steered right, I think, uh, is probably the best part about this. So We're, we're going to bring Chris on, who did WordPress security, and then not talk about WordPress. Yeah. The whole show. We're going to avoid it specifically. Wait, this, <laughs> isn't a, this isn't a Drupal show? Yeah, it's yeah. only Drupal. We only talk oh, about Drupal. It makes sense. It could be, if you want it to be. <laughs> Good Lord. Um, so the a lot of folks get started, um, you know, they don't think about security a lot because the first step that most web developers take is they go out, they hit Bluehost or HostGator or one of these folks for three ninety five a month. The shared host, they probably get a free SSL certificate with it, and that's what they do, and mm -hmm. they run along with that idea until the first time some website that they've never heard of gets compromised. And mm. then suddenly every WordPress site on that server that they happen to be sharing is suddenly compromised. And they're trying to figure out what they did wrong. And it was nothing. They didn't do anything wrong. It's just that shared hosting sucks and it's a terrible value for what you get out of it. Uh, I yeah. might be a little jaded because I might have a history with a couple <laughs> web hosts that uh, did not have good security. To say Last time I was in Aaron's neck of the woods, I was about two o'clock in the morning on an Amtrak going through upstate New York, trying to fix a site where a host had taken it down for <laughs> another site of the box had gotten compromised. So they took the whole box down and just basically told us all too bad. Wow. So the answer to why should you host your own website is, yeah, it's more work, but it's way easier to know if something's going wrong, if it's your fault. Um, I won't even say host your own, but pay for good hosting. Pay for I mean, good if hosting. If you don't know what you're doing, then you're probably worse off than even the shared hosting. But there's so many good hosts out there, you know, managed EPS, uh, you know, managed WordPress hosts, things like that. That yeah, they're 30, 35 bucks a month. They're not the 395 special, but you get what you pay for. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and that's that is a very fair statement that probably bears uh, uh clarification that we should look at the the bulk sort of uh what do you want to call it the clearing house web hosts um you know the the Walmart web hosts so to speak e Ver <laughs> yeah versus like say like a WP engine or somebody like this that i mean their business is 
hosting lots of websites and keeping them very secure and taking that stuff very seriously. Um, a disclaimer, uh, the company I work for, we do use WP Engine. Um, I am thrilled with it. That's not a paid endorsement of any kind or anything like that. It's been great for us. I've had no security problems with it to date. So uh, there is definitely a distinction there. But like I say, yeah, we we pay for that that uh, advantage. Um, it is not four bucks a month. It's I think they start at like 20 a month or something like that. Um, 30, I think, nowadays. Is it 30? Yeah, they just they raised prices recently. So... Uh, the, I don't the, have to sign that check. The continuum of that is on the one hand, you have the shared hosting on the cheap side, and then you have the self-hosted where you manage it. And then you have the managed, that's managed hosting, right? WP Engine? Yeah. 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 Or you could do the hybrid in something like DigitalOcean where you go just rent a box and then for $10 a month, you can, or more, depending on what plan you get, you can pay somebody like Server Pilot to manage that box that you mm. get for you and actually split that up. Yeah, and I've you know I've heard a lot about Server Pilot in the last probably six months. I've never used it yet, but it seems really interesting. Hmm. A podcast organization I do a lot of work for. I moved them over to Server Pilot. Oh, I don't know, a year ago, and they it's been wonderful for them. Which for our listeners, Server Pilot is basically a um, I don't want to call it a, a dashboard. Doesn't sound right, like a hypervisor kind of service, right? Isn't that a fair way so of putting? So much that it's more of a manager. Uh, it's more of a bot that goes in and just updates everything for you and makes sure everything's in good shape, handles the backups. So it's I wouldn't. It, it's not a virtualization thing in it of itself because you have a full. Like you actually have to go out and rent the real server. They only use. I think they only use DigitalOcean, but then they connect to that server and they install things for you and set it up and get everything secured for you. And I'm a DigitalOcean user myself, uh, and one of my side companies also uses it for our application infrastructure. Huge fan. Um, and that's where I get into stuff like, if you're paying $4 a month for you know a, a cheap shared host, you have no excuse to not spend $5 a month with a basic DO droplet and yeah. take a couple days and just learn how to configure it right. Yep. Uh, that value is worth its weight in gold because at the end of the day, the, going through that process in general is going to make you better. It's going to make you a better developer. It's going to help you understand how shit works. Um, I was going to say too, as a developer, you could spin up a $5. Yeah, I use Linode for my boxes just because yeah, they leapfrog. Linode's faster for a year than DigitalOcean will upgrade hardware and it'll be faster. Currently I'm on Linode because it this guy has been faster. If I can spin up for five bucks, I can run 20 or 30 dev sites. So any client that I'm working on on the side, forget this DNS, you know, Docker, Vagrant, whatever you want to use locally is great. But you can, if you can set it up on a server and actually show the client, mm -hmm. then you're not putting production stuff. You know, I, I don't know. I, I shy away from telling anybody who doesn't know servers well to put something in production on a for a client or anything other than their <laughs> own stuff. But for dev work, <laughs> You can, yeah, you can learn a whole lot. Sorry, Mike, I'm not trying to back that off, but I no. I do worry about that because I've made that suggestion before and it's blown up in my face. <laughs> there are no right answers. There are no wrong answers. I shouldn't say it. no. There are wrong answers with GDPR out there now. Uh, a, a lot of these, um, a, lot, a lot of the configurable servers like DigitalOcean or Vinode, um, the the hosts have. A hu usually have huge knowledge bases with all of like the like you want to install WordPress, you want to install like fail to ban, you want to install like UFW, whatever. And they, they'll have like these really elaborate how tos that explain exactly how to do it. And so even if you're not comfortable or understand how to do it yourself, if you're feeling adventurous, you can totally kind of go by the recipe. And they're they're usually pretty reproducible without problems. And yeah, that brings up a good thing too. If you're gonna do it, a combination of Fail to ban with UFW uh, slash IP. I mean, UFW is nothing but a, a way to make IP tables, which is the classic user Linux mm -hmm. firewall. It's a way to make it easier. And fail to ban just uses both of them. It just looks at log files. So when somebody tries to get to your box and they get the password wrong a couple of times, it blocks it at the firewall level. So if you're going to play with those services, DigitalOcean, Linode, Vulture, whatever. And you might be thinking... Like, oh, I just have a tiny little blog with maybe like five or 10 readers that most of them know me personally. Nobody will ever try to hack my site. And you would be wrong because you can put up, I had, I had a dev instance put up that was only used by me 
And within, oh, a day, I had Chinese and Russian IPs hammering at it and trying to break into SSH. <laughs> well, it's not about, you. people shouldn't think of themselves as, well, I'm small, so why would I ever be a target? Right. It's not about you. It's about when your IP address just comes up in the Rolodex. Yeah. That's all it amounts to. There's robots that are just scanning random numbers on the internet. That's really reductive to say, explain it like that, but that's basically what it is. Well, just go through internet and see which domains have been registered, see mm -hmm. if there's something vulnerable. If you're on DigitalOcean, hey, now you got another crypto miner, even if it's the five bucks. I mean, that's still resources, yeah. right? If you're on shared hosting, hey, look, now you got a couple thousand sites. Maybe you get lucky and you get the guy with 10,000 hits a day, and now you're spamming links out of there. <laughs> Well, with the rise of things like the uh, the JavaScript crypto miners and stuff, too, oh if you're God. injecting that into somebody's site or theme uh, and they don't even know it's there and outside of somebody noticing that their CPU is spiking when they visit your site, that could sit there for months without getting detected if somebody isn't paying attention. Yeah, um, it's, it's definitely something to, you know, to consider. And, and Aaron, you brought up like the documentation side. I found digital oceans documentation before i actually started using their service mm -hmm. and that's why i started using their service was because yeah. they yeah. killed it in the documentation department yeah, and yeah. being able to read through very clear because that's one thing i always find with a lot of uh, especially like real you know server level uh, uh command prompt level instructions can sometimes get a little gnarly um, mm -hmm. you know, depending on the person riding it, they may skip something obvious or they won't explain why they're doing a certain mm -hmm. step. And I'm big about that. Bad. I, I get really annoyed. It doesn't matter if it's a server thing, a code thing, whatever. When people just spit code out, but don't say what it is doing, that <laughs> annoys me because I'm trying to learn. I want to know, well, why did you throw this command in there? Because I may not need that later. I may want to build mm -hmm. on it or whatever. Um, but digital oceans stuff, like they they had the right idea because they kind of came at this with their service, but they really came at it with a robust documentation suite when they launched and they have been winning the SEO contest out of the gate against mm -hmm. ever, even when I'm searching for generic tutorials. Now yeah. I know Google, you know, they, they bias their search results anyway, but um, I s still regularly point people to DigitalOcean documentation. Cause it's like, it doesn't matter. If you're right. using, you know, Ubuntu, you know, 1604 or 1804 or whatever, it, it's still, the commands work the same. It's, you know, yeah. it has nothing to do with where you're hosting at that point. Yeah. DigitalOcean is by far the best resource probably out there right now for Ubuntu DevOps. Yeah, definitely. And the nice thing is that since Ubuntu is all um, like centralized repository package management, I know that like Red has RPM and everything, but like the app-based system is awesome because whether you're doing it on, your own private server elsewhere or your your home desktop or on your DigitalOcean account or on a Linode account running the same version of Ubuntu, the packages are going to be the same. Yeah. The configuration will almost certainly be the same. Sometimes like the directories will be mapped slightly differently. And so that's why like when Michael was talking about the explanations of things, that can be really nice because it's like, oh, you know, they explain like it's going to be in slash opt or whatever. Maybe yours isn't in slash opt, it's in slash Etsy or something. So, Chris, you mentioned, uh, I, I think it was, uh, I think you said it first, uh, fail to ban is obviously one of the first stops you make. Um, fail to ban basically just watches people trying to log into your server and you <laughs> point it at SSH or whatever you've got open. And um, I, I think, it, you know, you can lock it into uh, HT access stuff or, or whatever the case may be. And if somebody tries to log in three times and fails, their IP gets put in the IP tables as just a disallow. You don't yeah. get in. Yeah, and, and there's 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 three levels to this, right? First of all, you have to have IT, IP tables as a firewall. It's mm -hmm. just above the kernel level, kernel level. So if an IP is blocked at this, they're not even touching your PHP. They're not executing scripts. They're not getting to your Apache, Nginx, whatever. Okay, so you want that. It's going to save resources as you block somebody. You you know, and Ubuntu, you turn UFW on, you allow 80 and 443 and your SSH port, which should probably be set to something over 2,000. Mm -hmm. And then there's only three ports that even have access to your machine. Then you turn around and install fail to ban. Fail to ban just looks at your logs and you set it. You set these things, they call them jails, and you set these filters and you tell it to, hey, look at SSH logs. And then you know, look for X amount of 
attempts in there and you can have hard bands and soft bands and all this and that where it just blocks things. There's WordPress plugins, Drupal modules and all this and that that'll write back to your Apache logs, Nginx logs, whatever, say every time somebody logs in with the wrong WordPress account. So then it blocks them at the firewall level and they're not even messing with your machine. They're not racing your resources, et cetera. I mean, it really can cut down a load quite a bit. And with fail to ban in particular, those jails, it comes with, if I, if my memory is right, cause it's been a long time since I've even logged into mine. Um, the jails, you know, it's got several of them that are pre-configured for things like Apache and Nginx that it just, it knows how to look at those logs as long as you just say, here's where they are. Yeah, just most of them aren't turned on, though. I mean, when you install fail to ban, even if you say enable fail to ban service, none of the jails are active. You still have <laughs> yeah. to make sure you turn. I, I, I have to put that disclaimer. That's another one of those disclaimers I, I've seen the hard way when I've suggested it to people. They come back six months later. I've never seen any of these emails. You go, I'll take a look at your server. <laughs> oh, sorry. I guess I forgot that step where you have to <laughs> manually specify. Chris, I, like... Uh, you had mentioned changing your SSH port to something in the 2000s. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that point? Oh, sure. Historically, I mean, most services we use, uh, you know, anything on TCP or anything using an IP address comes in on a port, right? 80 for HTTP, 443, 1025 is SMTP. Uh, MySQL is 3306. You know, they, they all have these standard ports, most of which historically were under the number 2000. So most scanners historically, and I, you know, I gotta be honest, I don't know if it's still true where the scanners really start looking, but a lot of the end maps and a lot of the normal scanning that's done, just looking for open ports on a machine, just scans one through 2000, because there's a whole host of services that can be exploitable if they're there mm -hmm. in that range. So one of the and first things I typically do is, is switch, take any SSH port I'm using and up, and up it well over, you know, to a really high port number that I know is unlikely to be around another service. Mm -hmm. And, and right. that's ICANN's fault for anybody who cares to be interested. <laughs> they they are the ones who aside, and I mean I, I say fault. Well, you know it has to be done, but they're the ones who have kind of set up that standard of here are your registered ports. You know whether that's you know eighty four forty three twenty five. You know any of these twenty twenty two. Um, those have all been assigned by them so that all the machines knew how to talk to each other basically. Mm -hmm. Um, and then anything over, I think it, it runs up to like, you know, 1024 or something like that are the ones that they've registered and anything over that is then just fair game, I guess. Historically. Anything? Yeah. And of course this has changed now, right? Memcached is, uh, 11, two, one, one. My is 3306. There are others up there, but I still like, I mean, if I look through logs, I see very little scanning going on in the, anything over 2000 still. Yeah. If, if someone's going to be scanning, if they have, you know, a blanket list of IP or just like a, a, a mask of IPs they're going to be scanning and they're going to be scanning a whole bunch of ports, like it gets, it's a multiplicatively increasing thing. You know, you have 2000 ports across, you know, say, uh, 4000 IP addresses. That's what, 8 million, right? 8 million uh, different scans. Yes. I can <laughs> I my beer. I can't do that anymore. <laughs> so, like, that's eight million different port scans that they have to do. And so, if yes, like, they could just say that set their end map to scan above two thousand. But if you are in a crowd of other possible IP addresses, they're probably not going to do that because they'll probably find someone else who does does have something open lower than two thousand. It's like that whole thing. Like, I don't have to be faster than the tiger. I just have to be faster than you. Uh, that's there's a lot of truth to that. I'd be curious. I'd love to talk. I, I have to ask Tony Perez from Security next time I see him if that's still the number, the cutoff number, if that's still a significant thing because the way attacks have evolved over the years. But that's always been. One I think of those it's a, quick if you're high, things. if you're high value target, they're going to do like a full band scan. You sure, know, exactly. They're gonna, and they're going to be a lot more targeted and thorough. But if they're just doing like a casting a broad net. <laughs> So the the key there is if you go in and reassigning port numbers and stuff is beyond the scope of what I think we care to tell you about. If you want to know how Google it, you'll find a, a tutorial on how you change your, your ports for services. But if you want to do that, the other thing that dovetails in with that is using UFW. Um, and you can straight up say, not only am I you know, going to have SSH on port you know, 7,021, 
if you aren't from my IP address, mm -hmm. you also just can't get to it. Now, th the tricky thing about that is, A, of course, you have to know your IP address, and B, hope your IP address never changes. Yeah, that's kind of the big caveat. And I think I think you can specify, like, a range of IP addresses. Yeah, you can, you can yeah. do ranges if you're familiar with how, especially, like, if your ISP, you know, of course, is going to have a block. So yeah. you could narrow it down to say, yeah, I'm not going to, I'm not going to allow only my IP, but I'm going to trust that probably the other, you know, 256 on this uh, right. uh, range won't, or, you know, you can go up a couple uh, uh, octets on that. So or just uh, pay for a, I mean, if you know you have to do that, spend the three bucks a month on a, one of these VPNs that gives you a static IP. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of folks, like if you're doing it for work, your work is going to have, that's like uh, most companies, that's how they do it is, you know, when they've got their VPN set up, it's set. It has a uh, an internal IP at that point. And because all your servers are behind the firewall, exactly. that's all they let in. So even if you were on the network, you know, without being on the VPN, you couldn't get to their servers. Um, at least for us, I know that's how on, we work. So on the off chance that you do like, like, let's say that you set that up and then either you lose the VPN configuration or you forget what port you picked because you had it saved in your laptop and you just re-imaged it or something, most hosts will have a web-based console that you can log in through, which is kind of like a little virtual console. I think it's a Java app. DigitalOcean has it. Uh, yeah, it's, it's not good. It's terrible, but... It's good enough to get you around that. Yes. Yeah. Yes. If you're, if you're locked out, you can get in through that and you can check your SSH settings and like set them to something more open so that you can then reconfigure it. For for Mac, just use Terminal. For Windows, I use Putty. I like it. It works Putty's well. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about SSH just a hair more, though, because that's... Uh, and if you don't know, SSH is how you talk to a headless server. You know, you work with your desktop all day. If you're somebody who spends all day in Photoshop and all that, you know, you're used to the whole GUI interface. Um, when you work on a server, that's still pretty much all text because it's happening remotely. And that's just the most efficient way to get data back and forth um, and, and do it with low latency. Secure. SSH is the secure connection that makes that possible. Um, and so when you set that up, that's, you know, when you type in your IP address, whether it's in the terminal, in the putty, whatever, and it comes up and it says, you know, who's logging in? And you type in root. And what's your password? And you type in root. <laughs> You're in for trouble. <laughs> Don't set your password to root. <laughs> Just warning you. So the 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 reason I say that is you can configure SSH. And again, there are well, and I, I promise I'm gonna go through and look up specific tutorials on the stuff we're talking about. I'll make sure we leave links in the show notes. Um you can lock down SSH to only allow keys, which is a good way to prevent just you know brute force password attacks. Mm -hmm. So if somebody is just trying to open up your SSH port and feed it a username and password, it won't even get the opportunity. It'll just be turned mm -hmm. away right then and there. Um, if you don't know how that works, learn. Yeah, that's <laughs> actually, that's, I would say that when we're talking about the trinity of web development with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, this is like part of the, the core things for doing DevOps is learn how SSH keys work because you're going to use them all the time. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a big fan. I don't know what you guys use, but um, LastPass uh, I use for storing keys now. Mm -hmm. um, since I've moved between, I've got three different machines, four, four counting my phone, five counting my tablet, that I need to use keys on. And LastPass is like all hail because that keeps my keys organized. And mm -hmm. again, not a, not a paid plug of any kind. I just use it and I like it and it... Um, it helps keep that because the thing is you, you store when you when you generate a key pair, you're going to get a private key and a public key. You put your public key everywhere that needs to know who you are. And then you send the private key when you log in. And it does uh, a handshake that without getting into how that happens, it's like mixing paint, so to speak. <laughs> figure out if uh, if the colors are what they are supposed to be without necessarily divulging what the starter colors were. It knows it's supposed to end up with green, basically. That's um, similar to the way SSL handshakes work. Um, but you store those, but you need to keep that private, that private key needs to stay with you on a thumb drive 
in LastPass somewhere encrypted wherever because if you lose that private key, you lose your ability to log in and you better hope that you have a means of getting back into it. it it's you be scary. Key for the win. <laughs> I, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask this question because, Chris, I, I value your opinion greatly, which is why you're here. Um, so you're welcome. Uh, <laughs> Scotch isn't too bad, mind you. Um, I have had this conversation a few times with folks, and the answers I get are always interesting and never consistent. Um, you know, we, we talk about and we impress upon people the process of using different passwords for all their services. Don't use one password. Because if you use one password and one service gets compromised, all of them get compromised. And yet we encourage people to use key pairs. And I feel like that isn't better. <laughs> it is and it isn't. Because you remember, you know, a password is symmetrical. And the big difference between not having a thousand key pairs is they're asymmetrical, right? For let, Let's back up here, probably to give some background. You, you were mentioned keys a lot. A key in this case is we're talking about basically two sides of a password. You have one half that you have, one half that the server has, and only they only work in that combination. So you can use your password on anything, but unless it has that other exact matching copy, it's never going to work. And they're not interchangeable, so on and so forth. That asymmetrical difference, for all practical purposes, means you probably don't know. I mean, I, I'm paranoid. I have a separate key pair for pretty much every server I log into. It kind of goes with my nature. I'm actually looking at moving into GPG for a lot of us. You know, there's a gentleman by the name of Eric Mann, one of the people I respect most in this business. He works for a company called Tosni. But uh, he keeps doing a lot of tutorials and moving these all to Yubi keys. And now that I finally have a laptop or working USB ports, I can actually use these things, which are hardware <laughs> keys. I'll store these. But then I basically be using one or two keys for most of my servers. And the more I read on this, there's it's yeah, that, that asymmetrical nature, really, there's not a whole lot of downside to it from a practical point of view. That, not that's a way better use. metaphor than my paint one. So I'm going <laughs> like, to, so, I'm going to steal that for the future. Uh, fair enough. Just, just to uh, clarify, a UB key is a USB dongle you plug in. It has a little button on it and then it generates a super long string of alphanumeric characters. Well, which is basically one of the, it, it generates one of these keys in most cases, mm -hmm. or it can be used with a two factor. Like, you know, when your bank sends you the six digit code, it can generate those codes. Right. But you can program them. I'll have to send you guys the links for the for the show notes on this. But Eric's had a great tutorial on using it with to replace SSH keys, which has a lot of benefits if handled right. They ex they expire. Mm -hmm. or you, it's, I mean, if you're doing it right, then what you do is you set an expiration date on your Yubi key or whatever, so it expires after you know a year or whatever, a year, two years, whatever is reasonable for what you, what your threat model is, and. And you're only using one key that if you ever lose it, the worst case is you still have your backdoors into your servers. You know, that's the case with everything. You're changing, you, know, you lose your last pass account, you got to change your thousand <laughs> servers. So there's always that one point of failure, the way we're practically keeping track of these keys these days. But having a Yubi key and using GPG and well, PGP for uh, this type of authentication has a lot of benefits and simply that they expire. Yeah. Yeah. That's neat. I'll have to look. I have not heard of the the Yubi key. Now I've heard of some similar stuff, but that's a. I didn't know you could use it at, at like the SSH level. That's super cool. I'll there send was you that. guys the note the the link. I uh, linked a really neat tutorial on that after this that you could play with with it. It's kind of kind of fun to mess with. Yeah, so awesome. A few months back, there was that Equifax hack, and I remember in the aftermath of that, there was a lot of chatter in the security circles about things you should do immediately in case your social was a part of the breach. And um, one of the things was your IRS and social security, like the .gov, um, they were recommending that you set up an account on both of them and enable two-factor authentication so that it requires every time you want to log in, it sends you a text message. Um, you're probably not logging into it very often. <laughs> but... Um, it's a pain in the butt, and it sucks that like we would even have to do things like that. But it's better than, you know, having your data compromised. Well, you know, I used one password, an alternative to LastPass, and I keep a vault 
that I don't let download on my computers for things like that, like social security and IRS mm -hmm. and all that stuff. Cause you know, we're talking about authentication. Well, think about it or your social security number and that those cases are both authentication and identification. <laughs> <laughs> <Whoops. Right. laughs> that, what, what will be wow. interesting there is the new system that Google and Facebook are working on. Um, we talked about it on a real time overview episode and now the name is flittering out of my head, but uh, <laughs> they're working on a new uh, biometric two factor. Huh. I've seen it. I actually just use my YubiKey key for both Facebook and well, when I have to log, I, I try to avoid logging into Facebook period anymore, but yeah. for Google and Facebook and GitHub, all of them take YubiKey, key. So I just use those. Nice. That's cool. Nice. Yeah, definitely. Well, I, I will enjoy sharing that with our listeners. That sounds awesome. Um, uh, with SSH, the other side of this is um, when you set everything up, the first thing that happens is a root account gets made. And this is where every hacker movie ever has, you know, talked about how you get root and now you've got everything. And there's a reason for that because you get root, you get everything. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, it gets generated because something has to get generated and you need to know what it is. Um, but one of the first things that any tutorial will tell you to do is to get rid of that root account lock or lock it down. You can't get rid of it, but you can make it inaccessible to anything outside of the box. You can make it where there's not even allowed to log in. You can't log in right. as root period. You can't log in. You can't do anything that re except inside using the S mm -hmm. what they call the S U command, the super user command. Change um, the name of it for the love of God. <laughs> change the name of it is always an option. Um, and set up a separate account. That's your name. That's anything else and authorize it on sudo or whatever you want to use there so that it can execute the commands you want. But it then is sandboxed. Um, everything yeah. is logged within the servers automatically, usually on that. So if somebody does compromise that account, there should be a trail depending on how good your hacker is. But, um, you know, most people, I think, I, people don't understand and I... I you use the phrase, Chris, that I'll bring back up the threat models that come into play here. Um, folks think about hacking as this thing where a person sits behind a computer and is typing stuff into a machine and making another machine do something. Most 99% of hacking is automated. It's one machine just running a test against another machine. And if it passes, then it runs other tests until it stores something and then it leaves like almost no hacking involves a human being at this point because it's well, just not scalable. I I would contest that only on that social engineering is still a huge part of like the process of like security compromise. Targeted sure. attacks in general. Yeah. A targeted attack is often human directed. It's yeah. everything else that's different. It's but it's that's very one to one and people don't sure. scale. Human yeah. beings to have no ability to scale. So it's like one person is going to attack a machine, whereas another machine can attack tens of thousands of machines in that same amount of time. And you know, you said that, right? I said rename root, but no, I mean, the correct answer is don't allow root to log in. You use a separate account. So yeah. yeah, I've been doing it for so long. I sometimes think of that as my root account when I name my other accounts. But I mean, that's, that's part of, yeah. Every, any common denominator, any, it's horrible because it almost sounds like, and I get, in a lot of ways it is, it's security by obscurity, right? You're yeah. hiding something. Uh, but there's sometimes there was, reasons to use that in, on the very most basic level. Um, uh, D Dave Kennedy, he's a, a big name in the InfoSec community. Um, he was the keynote at AnyCon last year and out in Albany. I was fortunate enough to see that. And he was saying that 95% of the compromises, and I, he didn't qualify this statistic, as well, but 90, most of the compromises that happen are unsigned, execut executable, downloaded from the internet. So like stuff, like malicious code that's been injected into something that you execute after you're downloading it. Um, so if, you, if, you, if you're a sysadmin, and this is kind of out of scope for this talk, but if you're a sysadmin, like don't allow your users to run unsigned executables from the internet and that's and like the most of your things right there we can't even use usb drives on our machines at work huh. now that's because like we have like federal level security stuff that we have to comply with as a company because of some of our clients but yeah like they've our machines are hard locked down 
which is funny because the ones I have at work, they have lockdown software, but then they don't allow up like security updates and various things on the Mac. So I want to do a lot of my work with my personal machine because A, I can access things, but B, it's actually more secure than the work machine they give me. <laughs> My machine got reported back to our IT staff because I was running, uh, uh, I think it was Zamp or something like that, just a, <laughs> uh, an Apache server because I'm a web developer. I need a local yeah. web environment sometimes, but because it was not an approved executable. Hmm. Yeah. Our so, VPN, when I have to do VPN, you know, when I everything's ac accessible for VPN, it's, and I, of course I work remotely, I'm three hours from campus. And every time I look, Stack Overflow is always flagged as adult content. <laughs> the list goes on and on and on. So that's a little bit about SSH anyway. There's yeah. there's a whole lot more to <laughs> it. There's other things. There's yeah. There's there's a lot that goes into that. But that is because that is the front door of your server for most things. Um, it's important to learn it and understand it a little bit. And and I say we'll include some extra resources there. Um, the, the last thing I want to touch on before I need to go refill my glass and, and get some more ice because I need some water mixed in with this. Uh, it may not be the greatest scotch, but it does the job. Let me tell you. Uh, SSL. Now, even though SSL is it kind of – actually, it's it's the perfect transition element because it's it's server-related, but it's also you know web app-related and things like that. Um, one of the draws to shared hosting oftentimes is that they offer like a free, you know, free SSL certificate. Um, because they've just wild carded it to their root machine or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and it, that's great because it used to be getting a signed SSL certificate. It's expensive. Was expensive. Yeah. It was yeah. a, and it was a, it was hard to do. It was not a mm -hmm. user friendly process. You need to go like VeriSign or something, right? VeriSign, Komodo, any of these folks. Yeah. Um, you go in, you know, you have to put in server information, your information, you get these files. You're like, I don't know what to, what, where do I put these files? How do I <laughs> link them to stuff? You definitely put them in the wrong order and everything blows up. <laughs> right. uh, and SSL, for anybody who, again, this is, I know we have uh, some listeners who are getting into this stuff. The SSL is the thing that makes the HTTPS green on Chrome. <laughs> when you yeah. see the word secure up there, SSL is the thing that, helps cloak the information that you are sending to the website so that when you send a handshake to that site, it knows who you are. You know who it is. It knows that you're both the same people and it locks everything down within that tunnel. So in theory, <laughs> right, your stuff <laughs> is relatively cloaked. Now that doesn't mean your ISP can't tell what you're, you know, getting at or what type of data you're getting. Maybe not the contents of the data, but they can mm -hmm. tell the types um, and you know, cause packet shaping and stuff comes into play there. Um, but it, it helps ensure that, cause when you make a form submission, let's say a basic for contact form, something super mm -hmm. simple, and you click that send button, if there's anything in that transmission circuit, whether that's malicious or it's just a router with really aggressive logging, your stuff gets logged in plain text. <laughs> if you have SSL, it's just a payload at that point. Yeah. Um, and th all they can see is that data got sent. and the, But the data itself is obscured that way. So it's not just about like a hacker. It's just about somebody seeing something that you don't want them to see. You know, you don't want your bank account balance being seen by a third-party router somewhere out in the middle of your connection. Um, or so what, specifically these days, it's you're, you're sitting in Starbucks. You don't want yeah. to have Three or four years ago, there was a Firefox extension called Fire Sheep. And this is what really started the big SSL certificate when Facebook's Twitter and everybody started enforcing it. It was a Firefox extension I could install that would give me a sidebar. And if I was on an open Wi Fi, you know, an unencrypted a Wi Fi, I didn't have to put a password in, it would pop up with everybody around me. You know, somebody went to Facebook, it would pop up with Facebook. I click on it, now I'm there, them on Facebook. SSL is the one that blocks all that from happening, it wraps everything between my user and me and my server. So if if you're not if you're accessing a website over regular HTTP, like so not with S, not SSL, um, you can get uh, you can go on Amazon, you can get an external network adapter with Wi Fi. Um, I, I have one, it's an alpha, I forget the exact model number. Um, but you can put it in promiscuous mode, which means you can just sniff all the traffic that's flying around you through the air 
like in the Willy Wonka movie. And um, and you can just you can just listen to that and you can see come stuff come through in plain text. If it's going over SSL, then it's encrypted and you can't just view it. But if it's not, you can, you know, grab the images right out of the air. You can grab, you know, usernames, passwords, whatever else. Right. Right out of the you air. Guys, you guys both probably played with Wireshark at some point, right? Yep. Yeah. yeah. Well, I was just going to say a pineapple, too, is. Yeah. The cla- in some ways a classic for the script kiddies, if you will. <laughs> so SSL is important. And now there's also been a lot of, you know, talk in the last, what, two years about how now Google is, you know, factoring SSL into PageRank and, uh, you know, the, the notification in Chrome, in Firefox, noting whether or not a site is secure and now how they are aggressively noting unsecure sites it used to be like if your site was not using ssl there just it just didn't do anything it just yeah. showed you know it, it showed secure but it didn't do anything if it was unsecure now they're flagging it as not secure um so ssl has a lot of benefits even if you're just low level if you're using user data and I'm going to invoke the phrase and then take a drink. But G- if you've got anything GDPR related <laughs> at all, if you take an email, a name, you have a reason to have at least a little bit of cloak wrapped around that yeah. pipeline. Even um, before that, I mean, just your user's privacy. If you have a one page web app, I mean, most coffee shop, you know, co- you know, if I wanted to know who's applying to what job, sit in a local coffee shop in a smart, mm. in a small town, and it'd be easy to pull all that data right out. If you're, you're just you're protecting your users' privacy, if your users are submitting anything at all other than requesting content from your site, like you should probably be doing SSL with, with like let's at least let's encrypt. Mm-hmm. And yeah, and so boom, magic words, because that is what has changed the game for SSL and. I know there are a lot of people who have a lot of bad things to say about Let's Encrypt. Um, and they have valid complaints about, you know, the way people are you know, able to scam it, you know, since it's all automated, whatever. Mm-hmm. But for all of its failings, it also is granting a huge advantage to people running legitimate sites and needing to have that secure layer. You know, Let's Encrypt's magic is two things. One, it's a free certificate, but that's the easy part. CertBot is really the magic of Let's Encrypt. Yeah. The Cert- certificate yes. itself is trivial. Yeah. A certificate's a certificate. 4,096-bit 4, encryption is 4096-bit encryption, regardless if it's Komodo or who. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it's a, a green star, shows your name certificate. The encryption is the same. It's that CertBot where you can just go out and literally CertBot, or let's, you know, my, I go to my server, CertBot Renew. Everything's taken care of. Done. <laughs> it's so nice. <laughs> it, yep. it has taken what used to take half an hour, an hour of work, and distilled it down to like four commands. So, like, imagine, imagine what you might think as a listener that a crappy car is. Just imagine a crappy car, whatever that may be. I'm not going to name a make and model here. <laughs> whatever you think of a crappy car, that's Let's Encrypt. Kia Soul. Sure. So, <laughs> you got you're a hamster and you need a car. Get a Kia Soul, right? It's not. It's not a Cadillac. It's not a Ferrari. It's not like. It's not the best, but it gets you to where you're going, and and that's. But how is it not the? I mean, what what difference does paying for a certificate make? Because the things Michael was mentioning earlier, it's there's because I I think because you don't have the third party involvement from like a Verisign or a a, a trusted third party. And, but but there's not a cert, you know, that's let's, let's encrypt is the cert authority that Verisite is. So for the mm-hmm. cheap, the nine dollar, ten dollar a year, whatever it is, Verisite, I think they're nine ninety five. If you look at GoDaddy and most of them, that is wow. literally the same certificate, which huh. is a different signer as Let's Encrypt. The difference is entirely in the technology of how it's delivered. Yeah. Hmm. Then that, that's why I say CertBot such a such the magic. Key and that's where a lot of people don't like it. CertBot makes it too easy. There's no knowledge required at all. Let's encrypt it all. <laughs> okay. Know, get cert. Yeah, you, know, you don't have to go online and type, but you still have to type in your name, your email address, and the basics for, to get the cert. But there's no verification on a normal cert. It's only when you go to a bank and you see the name of a cert in there. There's different trust levels, but those are two hundred, three hundred dollars certificates. And, and if you need that verification, 
you're still painting. Yeah, I think that's kind of what I was talking about, just maybe not using the right words. Um, let's not forget, though, the irony of this part of the discussion, because uh, wasn't it Trustico uh, a few months back that had like 23,000 SSL certs compromised? And did just <laughs> was just like, listen, we can't trust any of these certificates anymore, and Trustico won't answer our emails, so we're just posting all the private keys now, so they have no choice. Yes. <laughs> so... The idea that paying for a certificate makes it better is just patently false. It's, you know, it's a belief, but there is just nothing that makes that true. And well, when you do pay, well, the, 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 that's not entirely true because when you're talking about verification, you're talking yeah. about you want to verify. You know, encryption is one thing. Verification is another. If you want to pay $300 to be verified, that's different. Now you're sending incorporation documents, driver's license photos, all kinds of verification documents back to the signer, VeriSign, Komodo, Let's Encrypt doesn't even offer that level of verification. Mm -hmm. You have to send that to one of those services and come back and then you, you know, then you don't just get the secure in Chrome, but it actually tells you the name in green letters next to it, right? But right. that's a whole little different level. And same certificate still, but the verification on the certificate is a different level. Yeah, and that's if that's what you need, you don't need to listen to our episode. Probably, <laughs> yeah, probably should go. Yeah, I tell you what, I need to get some more ice. So, guys, let's take about uh, 40 45 seconds here. Uh, we'll come back afterwards and we'll start talking a little bit about the website uh, of the security stuff. And uh, yeah, let's do that. Brilliant. Sounds good. Yep. The Drunken UX Podcast is brought to you by our friends at NewCloud. Are you trying to build a case around an interactive map for your school, city, or business? NewCloud's interactive map platform gives you the power to make and edit a custom interactive map in just minutes. Their team of professional cartographers specialize in map illustrations and are ready to design a rendering to fit your exact needs. One map serves all your users' devices with responsive maps that scale and blend in seamlessly with your website. Visit them online to request a demo at newcloud.com slash drunkenux. That's nucloud.com slash drunkenux. So I guess my end result here, or my decision is that, okay, Spayburn 10, not a great scotch. Not terrible. I've had worse. Um, I've had much worse. Um, it's not entirely bad. It's not a bad scotch. Um, it's like the Kia Soul of Scotch. <laughs> the Kia Soul of Scotch. Um, and it does get the job done. So uh, let's see how many more mistakes I can make before the night. So. Uh, yeah, so continuing the discussion. So we talked a little bit about servers and just kind of what you should be thinking about. And um, let's let's be honest we basically gave you a lot of stuff to go google later hopefully and we'll, we'll have <laughs> links to a lot of those in the show notes as well so maybe we can save you that much but a lot of it is going to require you to go out read some stuff look at some commands and and understand how these things work that's cool we're going to do more of that now but we're going to talk more about the the web application layer so once you get into apache and you are making a website what has to happen there above the server so to speak um, in the atmosphere of the server to keep your stuff secure. Um, and this is where, again, take a drink. If you do anything that involves something that may be impacted by GDPR, there's a huge amount of emphasis on that part of security because if, and all the stuff we talked about in the first half of the show, all of that is about preventing a breach to begin with. Because if you are compromised, under GDPR, if that applies to you, you've got 72 hours to disclose that breach. Ideally, we want to prevent that that event from ever happening. Um, the server is one layer, but then the application is another layer. So that's what we're going to look at. And the most basic intrinsic type of attack is sort of this injection. Uh, and, you know, we, we can argue, too, over whether injection or, or cross-site scripting is sort of more basic, but I, I put injection, injection as the first bullet point in my notes. So that's all the injection. Well, really, cross-site cross scripting is a type of injection, right? I mean, in all practical purposes. I you, won't argue that. You are, I, what, what Michael's talking with injection uh, would be like URL injection 
um, if you've ever looked at a URL, it'll have like a question mark sometimes, and then it'll have like a word and then an equal sign and then some other words or numbers. It's doing stuff where you're messing with the stuff after the question mark, and there's but, different techniques that you can do. Well, it's not even. It might be that it might be a form. You know, putting a the right kind of commands and forms. I mean, let's, let's let's back up a little bit. I mean, if we're going to talk about application security, we probably should sh give a shout out to OWASP and the OWASP top 10. Mm -hmm. The OWASP is the Open Web Application Security Project. And every three years, it was four for the last one. They come up with the 10 most uh, prominent vulnerabilities in web application security. Things like injection, XSS, CSRF, uh, mis security misconfiguration. I uh, you, you guys will have the link. I think it's already in the show note doc that you gave me before this. I threw the link for that in there. Mm -hmm. But so as we're talking about, you know, there's a couple that Mike's already mentioned, but they're really all coming out of this OWASP top 10 is the biggest things to worry about. Mm -hmm. And the real watch there is trying to keep somebody from running code that isn't supposed to be running, which at its heart is really an injection. The whole point of an injection is not running code that, were, that, you're, that you didn't intend to historically with when we talk injection that means not running it within the server there's the old xkcd drop tables cartoon right <laughs> I, I mean I feel like somebody i saw recently had something like that like, as a username. oh yeah that's my, that my, my twitter yeah. username is drop table <laughs> users or no it's dash dash drop table users yeah Aaron, aaron's twitter uh twitter tag or twitter name is a injection attempted injection attack so apparently twitter's watched out for that <laughs> yeah. And I do think that, was the that with that, that note was this idea of working, trying to push data into something that shouldn't be there. So whether that's a form, a URL, some kind of input, because websites, whether it's a search form, a login form, a data submission form, a help ticket form, a contact form, um, they take in information and one of we I mentioned earlier that you know most hacking is by a computer, but and while injection testing can absolutely be automated, a lot of that does come at the human level too of somebody just trying to see. I want to see if I can get into their site, and they feed in to these kinds of uh, commands. Where and there's um, there's a site, and now I don't remember the name off the top of my head that lists like. And it's a top 10 kind of list, like what OWASP does, and but it lists them as uh, like database commands that people will try to put into form fields hmm. because they are trying to see if when that, whatever that form sends to, if it'll hit that string and do something weird. Yeah. Uh, and, and also what you're talking about too is a type of injection called remote execution vulnerability. Really, in other words, you're trying to run code. You're trying to get the server to run code. You're trying to get the host or the server that has the website on to, to run code as an injection, right? Drop tables in the database. In other words, delete all your database tape, whatever it might be. But then uh, it's one of those distinctions. I, I'm, I'm always, I've been corrected. Uh, Tony Perez from Security, every time I give this talk, I actually, I, I've given about half a dozen times a, a, <clears throat> basically a break, quick breakdown for WordPress developers on the OWASP top 10. And every time he sees it, he goes, you know, uh, XSS is an injection, or this is an injection. I'm like, I know, but I'm trying to differentiate between <laughs> a crowd that doesn't, you know. So shout out to Tony there that I've, I've finally taken his advice tonight. But uh, I, no, in all seriousness, though, I mean, that is what we're trying to prevent. We're trying to, by, by injection, we're simply running code that we didn't want run. So and it's I, have, I have a, it, it's embarrassing, but it happened long enough that I can laugh about it. One of the first web applications I ever made was a rudimentary content management system. This is like shortly before WordPress came out or like right around when WordPress 1.0 was out maybe. So it was a really long time ago. And there was a basic, you know, login system. It was using MySQL in the back end, PHP in the front end. Anyways, um, one of my friends worked in a different IT department within the same organization. And he, uh, after I left, he's like, hey, did you know you had an SQL injection vulnerability on your app. And I was like, what do you mean? And apparently, in, if you put in the username field, um, dash dash, or no, if you did uh, uh, or one equals one semicolon, uh, and then that was it, then it would log you in as the first user, which happened to be the admin user. 
That that is an old school trick too. Yeah, that was yeah that was embarrassing. But in my defense, it was my first web app, and yeah, and yeah. So I can send you my old code. That's just as bad. I, I yeah, I get yeah. that. But, but, <laughs> sure, I'm using code somewhere that probably has some yeah. kind of thing just like that. And it's this is where like to prevent those kinds of injection things. Whatever language is your language of choice. If you are a database programmer, you learn, you know, the the what is it, MySQL real escape string. If you're a PHP mm-hmm. developer, it's I think filter there. Um, mm-hmm. JavaScript just has an escape function. All of these languages come with a function built in that is designed to escape characters. And by escaping the characters, it means that when it gets to whatever processor you're using, whatever uh, system is, is going through that code, it will treat it like a string character as opposed to a code character. I'm probably using the wrong definitions for those words, but... Sanitize early, escape late. Was if you're a WordPress it? developer, uh, or if you work in WordPress, WordPress has its whole library of its own for both escaping and sanitization. And if you install the WordPress coding standards in your editor or IDE, it'll tell you right in the line. Hey, you've got a CSRF vulnerability right here. You've got an XSS vulnerability right here. It'll tell you, hey, you didn't escape this line. Yeah. Gigo. Garbage in, garbage out. Garbage out. Yeah. <laughs> if if you if you're taking anything without paying attention to what it is, that's a problem. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's an easy, you know, it's one of those things. It's like it's not something I want to slap somebody on the wrist for necessarily. That's an easy mistake to make if you just don't mm-hmm. know. Um, you know, and like with Aaron, you know, the yeah. first thing you write, it's easy to make those mistakes and not think about how, if, if that variable drops into code, what does that mean? Especially if it's deep, you know, a function calls a function calls a function and you're just not thinking about, well, that double quote is going to actually get interpreted and then terminate a command early. Cause yes. What what this gets to, and and uh, Chris, like you were saying, you know, somebody puts it in to try to make the server execute code. What they're really looking for is for the server to do something that isn't expected, whether that's spit out HTML into a page that it shouldn't do, or make a JavaScript alert pop up on the page. When if I do a search, search should not pop up a JavaScript alert, <laughs> but if I search for you know script alert one. And it does it, then I know, oh, the server is doing something there where it's treating that like actual code. <laughs> uh, and then you got an XSS vulnerability if it's running back in the browser, right? Right. Yeah. Then we XSS what... is for all practical purposes, cross site scripting. And for all practical purposes, it's running code that you didn't want to on the client. You're that... causing the browser to run code. Then we uh, get into a type two reflective attack. <laughs> <laughs> Are you? My favorite story with that is WordPress. I think it was 4.4. The, the WordPress that allowed emojis and comments, right? Oh. Do, do, do either of you know how, why they allow emojis and WordPress comments? I do not. Why WordPress they used to use UTF-8. And UTF-8 has issues in MySQL where you can basically cut off. You put in the right command, it'll cut it off, and then it'll continue it in the next comment. And that could be exploited. I, I don't remember all the technicals of it. There's a loop conference video from Nason that explains for an hour and a half why it took them a year and a half <laughs> to patch uh, this vulnerability, which in the end was switching the type of collation used in the WordPress database tables. And as a side effect, it allowed emojis. So they <laughs> had this big, huge WordPress release that allowed emojis, which the reality was you could leave half of a comment with one half of the command, the other half of the comment with the other half of the JavaScript. Now your linters aren't going to catch it. Your sanitization might not catch it that way. Spits back out. It all gets spin, spun back together. And oh shit! Now you got a good XSS attack. Oh. <laughs> That's evil. That's awesome. <laughs> I I have to give credit to the people that figure out that kind of stuff. I mean, that takes a special mind. That took the some of the smartest guys at WordPress, Pento, Nason, and those guys. I think it was about a year and a half to find a good way to, you know, it's not just patching it; it's patching it so you don't break half the freaking internet, right? Yeah. Right. <laughs> so that's a good segue from injection to XSS. So there are, I say two, but I guess there OWASP in particular. I think I, I uh, recognizes three XSS three. attacks: type one, type two, and what they call a type zero, which that's the one, like, I don't get the type zero entirely, but 
we'll see if we can hash it out here in the next few minutes. So type one is the persistent attack. It's doing something. So like a comment, if I enter a comment on your website that gets stored in the database, and then every time somebody visited, visits that page, it loads the information from the, the website's database, that then runs some kind of code. So every time it happens, the, the user has to do nothing. They just visit the page and they get attacked. Um, reflective is when you put something in a URL. So you figure out, well, the search box is executing code. So if I send somebody a link that says query equals script do a bunch of stuff and I run it through bit.ly, this was you know, the reason <laughs> why people would get emails, spam emails with lots of bit.ly links. It's because they were hiding reflective attacks inside those links. So you click it, you end up on the site and the site looks, you know, either normal. Maybe it doesn't look normal. Maybe it looks like PayPal. Maybe it looks like anything. Um, and then this type zero is what they're calling a DOM attack, which executes a command. At the, and Chris, it sounds like you understand what I'm getting at here. So correct me here if I'm wrong, but it, it executes code at the server level in the DOM, but then removes it before it gets to the client side. What? I don't think it always has to remove it. A DOM attack is you're modifying the DOM. So the attack's going to be spit out. So in other words, it's, you know, uh, Reflected is typically targeting an error page, right? Or a search page or something that's that's stateless. Yeah. You're, you're, there's no state. You're not carrying it forward from page to page. Uh, a DOM attack is typically targeting a, a standard page, but it's modifying something within there to display it. Uh, the, would, the challenge to me with this is what, the, understanding the difference between a DOM attack and a persistent attack. And yeah. I'll be honest, I'm... It, it's been a few years since I was targeting that stuff. I don't worry about it in those terms. I worry about the difference between reflected and persistent, because obviously that just if you have persistent, you need to look in your database and clean that shit out. Pardon my French. Yeah. Yeah. But uh... <laughs> I had, and literally, what, yesterday... Um, Chris, why would uh, you curse on our show? <laughs> Damn it. Now I have to mark right. the episode explicit. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Man, now Fuck. nobody's going to listen. Um, hey. No, I had a one of my Twitter followers, uh, uh, Brendan, uh, who I won't I won't call out your last name just in case, but Brendan <laughs> sent me a tweet and said, dude, I was looking up one of your Tag Manager articles, and this came up and sent me a screenshot, and there was a big old butt right in the, <laughs> like It was a one of those uh, ad you know deals, but like the very first article just had a big old butt in the thong, and it was a, a WP VCD um, malware. And huh. I went back and looked because it wasn't, I knew like my blog. And so here you go at, to the internet. My blog is running an older theme that hasn't been updated in, in ages. Um, and I thought, well, maybe it's time to change. But I got looking, I'm like, no, it's not my theme. It turned out I had set up a site, just a little compartmentalized site a couple years ago for a conference that I was giving a presentation at. And so I made up a sandbox site and forgot about it. But oh. that site had an exploit in the theme and because it was running on the same server. So remember what we were saying about shared hosting earlier, you compromise one theme because it's all, they're all at their own directory, but they're all on the same level running at the same permission level. They were able to then execute code that injected information into my site's theme so that anybody who visited it got fed this other information so that was a persistent attack at that point so um, when they I, were loading javascript I, at my level because it was stored in my files and that's the that's the way typically with wordpress and a lot of the, co the modern content management systems they're doing it you know we say persistent as if it's stored in the database it's very rare that i've cleaned a site where it's stored something stored in post content or something in the database it's it's stored throughout I've gone in sites where there are thousands of files, each with the same. Yeah, I, have, I, I don't distinguish between stored in a database and stored in a file at that point. Yeah, I, I, I only stored. do it for the sake of folks. easier to clean if it's on the file system. Yeah, yeah. If uh, I when I was at IU, we had uh, we had a, our first pass at doing student blogs. We had a compromise happen, and. Um, it went for probably a few weeks without us noticing it because it was 
so cleverly targeted it would use um, IE conditionals to target specifically, I think, IE5, maybe IE6. And the my me and the other developer, we only developed in Firefox, so it never came up for us. And it didn't come up for most of my coworkers who all were using the most recent version of IE, which I think was 7 at the time. But we got a couple emails from someone who was using a very old version of IE and... Um, it, it came up for them, and it was... I forget what it showed, but it was a bunch of spam links or something. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I would be remiss, though, in talking about all of this without talking about WordPress for a minute. So we've got Chris here. He is the grandfather of WordPress security. Let me fluff his ego a little bit. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure there... he's fluffing my ego. is calling me old. I don't know. <laughs> that could also be true. Maybe maybe I have something against you. You don't know. I got three um, more weeks in the fifth, fifth decade, so give me a break here. <laughs> Word, well, isn't WordPress celebrating its like 15th anniversary this week? I yeah, think, right? in fact, uh, you know, I got the shirt going and everything. <laughs> oh, yeah, you do. Oh, oh, I want that shirt. I'm going to, I need to find one of them. You can uh, buy it off their website. <laughs> I don't want to buy it. I want somebody to give it to me. <laughs> I'm cheap. I run I run a podcast out of my wallet. <laughs> I can't buy insurance. So I I and the reason I think it's this is a super valuable topic is because what you built addresses a lot of those real sort of high level application level things that you should think about doing. Things like changing the default admin password we talked about this with ssh and root and the same is true for wordpress you install wordpress you install drupal you install joomla you install typo3 do people still use typo3 i don't know but <laughs> all of these systems you know they install an admin user to get you started but then there's an admin user that has user id one which why they haven't put in scripts that just randomize the name and id of those i don't know but they do um you know, randomizing table prefixes, um, changing, you know, checking and changing file permissions, changing directory paths, um, obfuscating login points. Um, so the first question I want to ask is what got you interested in saying, I want to build a security plugin for WordPress? Well, at the time it was, I mean, I was working for a university, I was working for Southern Illinois University in aviation and WordPress was a good you know, it was, most of our sites were Drupal. Our main site was Drupal. And WordPress was great for, you know, a multi-site. It was actually WordPress MU at that point. Excuse me. Before multi-site was in core. And uh, it was great to allow students, not students, but, you know, student groups, faculty, and that to have their own sites. But I had, like, 20 security plugins going. I'm like, well, this is crazy because one would update and another one would break. And, you know, all that kind of jazz. So I started putting together one of my own. And that's why it got that started. But like you say, it was, it was all about best practices, you know, force password changes. Uh, a lot of things that are completely obsolete now, like changing the database prefix, you know, hiding the login area. There's there's a joke, J Jeff Rowe, Jeff Chandler from WP Tavern still refers to me as the asshole because of that one. <laughs> I don't know anything about that joke. Uh, the, the, the running joke is I'm an asshole and what, when we tried to release, because that feature was so stupidly complicated, when we did our first release with iThemes, we had huge, we had three or four hundred beta testers. Nobody noticed it was thoroughly broken. <laughs> I, I estimated when I started going back through logs and tickets, it probably crashed about ten thousand sites, like completely. Oh my god! Oh god! <laughs> uh, it, yeah, it was it was bad. It, and it took us a good week to really get that feature patched. But people loved the feature. I kept wanting to pull it out, and people were like, no, because it doesn't do a damn thing. <laughs> but it was God, there. I'm such an asshole, Chris. It, well, I was at a WordCamp uh, Miami, and first time I met Chandler in real life, I'm talking to a bunch of guys. He walks up, and he goes, so you're that asshole who crashed all those websites. <laughs> who the hell are you? <laughs> uh, hey, what can I do? With, that's with great fame comes great responsibility. <laughs> Yeah, so, my bad code didn't crash my own site. It just crashed everybody else's. Great. <laughs> but you still, though, I mean, the, the tool itself, though, was inspired and obviously had a huge amount of value in, in taking care of, you know, security issues at the WordPress level that yeah. the, the app itself does not deal with. And 
a lot of those are things you're automating. You or when you built it, you were, you designed it to automate processes that, much like setting up your server, you can do on your own. And I think that's true for whether you're using WordPress. Uh, you know, we you know Drupal keeps coming up. Whatever, um, whatever system you're building or using, or if you are building one, don't use admin as your admin <laughs> user. Don't use ID one as your main user, you know, these are things, you know, make sure the right directories are writable. Make sure that you are. And they're not the wrong, the right, the wrong directories aren't writable, or maybe it's the right directories aren't writable too. Right. Right. Yeah. Or files, you know, make sure your config files aren't publicly writable. Um, You know, make sure they have the right users assigned to them. You wrote that to make that easy. And that's, you know, we, like we were talking about cert bot and, part of the magic of CertBot is that it makes that process of getting that certificate easy and deploying it easy. There's nothing that it does that a normal person can't do. It just saves you having to research it and learn it. But learning that stuff, there is a huge amount of value in sitting down and understanding, okay, I'm installing this plugin to do all this workload, but I could also save myself a whole lot of execute time and things if I just change this stuff myself. And I want to stress to folks that they should look at that as a stepping so- stone, not a solution. Because mm-hmm. uh, there's still ways to get it. around it. Yeah, I, and that's just it, exactly. It was, I mean, the idea of the plugin was originally enforcing best practices. I mean, there was a couple features in there. You know, we worked for a university that had night flight, was an aviation program. So the student workers at night tended to put parties on the various websites in WordPress. So there was a feature in better WP security, still an iTheme security for a way mode where you can set the hours where nobody's allowed to log in and update anything. So for an, <laughs> which for an office can come in really handy for that type of attack. Huh. But, and you know, I call it an attack. It was our own students, but it's that it's legitimately sick. isn't an attack. You're well, somebody's it, using the site the way they shouldn't. I was just going to say that. Yeah. You're, but, you're well, doing, was, you're using it some the way you're not supposed to. Yeah. What was the phrase you used? Threat model. Exactly. Our threat model was our own students in some cases. I don't mean like they, they were bad people. Let, let me phrase this. Let, you know, I, disclaimer, they were all good people. They had a neat way to tell all the rest of the students that were out that night where the party was, so they did. <laughs> but that gets frowned upon by those above them and those in charge. And so I'm, we stop it. <laughs> and I'm sure other platforms have tools that are just as good and equivalent in terms of, of doing those same functions. I'm not as familiar with those, so I can't speak to them, whether, you know, Drupal, if I haven't said that word enough now, <laughs> you know, I, I don't know what the tool is there because I avoid Drupal like the plague. I've been burned by it on too many version updates. So, yeah. um, but I don't want to end the episode before we talk a little bit about Red Team. Um, I think that's something that we need to hit on in terms of, you know, what you can learn and how to how to get more skills in this area. So the the episode so far, we've been doing blue team, which is defense. It's like DevOps and server admin and everything. It's preventative. It's learning how to defend your your targets against attackers. But red team is the opposite. That's the attacking side. When, and when I, did I, we switch from blue team, red team, or from white hat, black hat to red team, blue team? When I don't that... know. I don't know, but I have a book that is called the RTFM red team field manual and it's like a skinny little maybe 100 page book and it's got all these different like uh easy bake commands and other things a quick reference for like windows linux mac etc but it's rtfm you know, like, like read the manual the last cert <laughs> course i did on pen testing i i never heard the term red team used in it that was a year and a half ago so <laughs> i i well i i hear it a lot in the infosec groups i i do a, a monthly meetup and they use it a lot, but yeah, I see um, a lot in, in social. I just don't see it too much in yeah groups and things like that. I don't know when we started using it. Um, what, it would be the equivalent the, of black hat, though. What yeah. What is our our term that we want to to tag this with? Is it infosec? Is it opsec? Is it websec? What's the uh, proper term for the general web security area? Infosec or websec? I think either one, because there was an awful lot of DevOps covered in there, right? Which is Traditional infosec, yeah. Websec when we start getting to the application level. Well, actually, I I said a minute ago that Black Hat was similar to Red Team. I don't think that's actually correct. Uh, like yeah. White White Hat is both Red and Blue Team. Black Hat would be Red Team, but with 
perhaps malicious intent. Red, or, black, we, white are, are intent. Red, red, blue are direction. Which side you're on? Yeah. yeah. Um, but I, I think that in order to understand better how to defend against things, it's good to know how to attack with them. And um, in the show notes, I'll put a couple links to um, volnhub.com, which has a bunch of like uh, ready-made virtual machines you can download, and then you can attack to your heart's content without running any risk of uh, legal recourse or anything because you're running a serv- you're running the server on your own machine. Um, so you can batter the heck out of it. And then hackthebox.eu is a free VPN lab you can connect to that gives you different machines you can try to attack and compromise and secure root access or elevated privileges at least. Um, the the catches with Hack the Box to get a invitation you actually have to do some clever uh, like there's no invite link directly you have to find it and i'm I'm not going to disclose how to do that because that's sort of like (laughs) the are you ready to to do this stuff if you can't solve this simple puzzle you won't be able to solve the things inside of it um i i I am a member of it i'm not great at infosec but i am i do know that much (laughs) no i I, the first rule of fight club right yeah yeah and second (laughs) if you want to and if you if you're looking for a path that it is a little more traditional it doesn't require Problem solving up front. There's always the SANS courses, SANS.org. If you can afford them. <laughs> if you can afford them. Or, I mean, if you're a web developer, I was going to say, if you're a web developer and you get any kind of personal development, there's some neat courses in there for pen testing and other things. There, and there's, there's two things that I think are relevant, Aaron, to what you're talking about, which mm-hmm. is one, yes, you're totally right. It's hard to learn defense if you don't know offense. Uh, and two, I would absolutely go out, find yourself a friend and say, hey, see if you can get into my box. Try to break it. Mm-hmm. But I want to make sure to throw a very important caveat here. Depending on who your host is, make sure you either sub- in, uh, submit a support ticket, <laughs> ask, check what their penetration testing I would rules say just and restrictions are. <laughs> play it safe and don't have your friend attack your box if it's not hosted on your personal computer that you can physically touch. You, on a well, local network, like yeah. and WP Engine um, has this policy that because um, my uh, RCSO had asked about this because mm-hmm. they were wanting to bring in a third party like a security audit mm-hmm. service, and they wanted to ask about that. And like WP Engine, they have a you submit a ticket and they will move your site into a specially housed area where it can be tested. So a lot of these hosts whether it's DigitalOcean, WP Engine, a managed host, whatever, it's worth looking because a lot of them do say it's okay to do it. You just have to let them know. When, uh, when I was interesting. Okay. When I was at Cornell, we um, we hosted our primary domains on AWS, and we had to do occasional like uh, scanning. I think we use Rapid Seven, um, just like you know the standard battery, and uh, you have to let AWS know in advance we're going to be doing pen testing during this period of time for this reason on these specific domains. Um, just, just so you know, so that they know, so they don't automatically like flag the site or shut it down or anything if it's getting targeted. Yeah. Well, and you don't want to blacklist the the people who mm-hmm. are legitimately trying to alert you to a problem because right. they, they will, if they are doing their job right, they should look like a bad guy. Yeah. But obviously they aren't. So that's something it's, it, I think it's incredibly important. And, you, and you're also right that at the end of the day, if you're not sure, host it locally, you know, and to like uh, Chris's earlier point, you know, get a Docker set up that can replicate mm-hmm. your exact, inf- you know, the exact setup, the exact configuration options that should be there so that when they hit it, they're hitting something that is equivalent in all the meaningful ways um, so that, you know, apples to apples basically is what you're after. And uh, the other thing is is a more general security topic. The uh, uh, the idea of social engineering of like you know hacking the person instead of the technology. Um, the really great book on that is Art of Deception by Kevin Mitnick. Oh um, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. It's it, it's that's old, but most of the stuff that he uses in it, like pretexting and other and other like tricks, are still they're things he actually did back in the eighties and nineties, and they are still usable today 
I, I said it earlier. People don't scale. They also don't change. Right. <laughs> We change much more slowly than computers do. The way you trick a person is mm -hmm. totally different. Well, you even think back to like the old hacker stuff when they're calling them up, and you know, I always think of the the, the best part of hacker is the part that lasted the longest is when he calls it up and he says, "Yeah, my computer is out." And, you know, A W O L. Yeah, on the BLT drive. <laughs> the BLT exactly. <laughs> It still but works. Still, yeah. yeah, it really does. I mean, that's I'm, if you're gonna target anything, that's the I'm not gonna do tell it. you why I know it still works. <laughs> <laughs> the, the thing that I really got from that book, though, is that it, it's the the process of social engineering, at least from that book, anyways, is like a gradual escalation, like of small increments. You have, and you kind of leverage. Like I know this much about your organization. That means you can give me this tiny bit more, right? And then you get from that, and then you know the little bit more, and you go to a different person. It's like, oh, well, I know these three people that you work with, and I'm in this office that you know is right down the hall from you. So clearly you can call me back and give me this number that I need. Which which should scare folks if you think about how much you use Facebook, LinkedIn, mm -hmm. things oh, like yeah. that. Chris, man, I want to thank you for jumping on tonight with us. Um, I know yeah, we've, we've right. probably run, I haven't, watched the clock now and i'm sure we've ran really long but <laughs> i have enjoyed this absolutely thoroughly i i appreciate you coming on and making sure that we're keeping things straight and uh, i know that some folks know me as a noted security expert kansas man but let me tell you something <laughs> Se security in kansas is not necessarily as stringent as elsewhere in the world so believe it or not that's not that much of a compliment for if only our world was like global online or something <laughs> Does that make Chris Wickman notable security expert, Florida man? <laughs> oh God! <laughs> I don't I think I've seen any more stories about you in the newspaper. <laughs> oh, hey. Well, it's better than Jeff Rose's uh, name for me. <laughs>
You can connect with us on Slack via junkinux.com slash Slack to sign up for it. It's Slack is a whole lot like IRC, except prettier. So I'm yeah. wondering if you haven't used it yet, because I'm sure most people, or if you use Discord, Discord is basically like a fun version of Slack. Discord and Slack look almost <laughs> identical. They use the same library. That's why. They must be. Yeah. Um, at any rate, I've, I guess I've, I can only leave you guys with one other uh, piece of information. And that is to keep your uh, personas close, but uh, what your users closer. 